Father God, we thank you for Barry being here today to bring your words to us. And we pray that through him we may hear your words. That we may hear what you want to say for us. And that when we go from here, we will be a little closer to you. Amen. Amen. Oops. Um, Good morning. Uh, I am Barry Jones. I'm a, a member of this church. The reading today brings us to the subject of marriage, of which the Bible has much to say. Oops, I must get this. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul's advice is this, those who marry will face many problems in this life. Thankfully, it's not all gloom and doom. This is a picture of our daughter, Anna, celebrating her 25th wedding anniversary uh, at the uh, Grand Canyon. And Anna and Dan were married in this church 25 years ago. She actually became the first paid uh, youth worker. Anyway, it seems to be working out well. Um, although the reading starts with uh, advice to wives, I want to focus on Peter's word to men and husbands. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, treat them with respect as the weaker partner, and heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Note, in the same way. In other words, husbands should respond towards their wives with equal reverence, treating them as equal partners in Christ, but with special sensitivity and consideration towards the demands of their biology so that nothing will hinder your prayers. What Peter is saying is that the way a man, a husband, treats his wife is a measure of his Christian maturity, how he connects with God. A man may do good works, but if he, does, if he neglects his wife, he is not pleasing God. Uh, the, in fact, the, the well-being of our wife or husband should be our first priority before God because, after all, our wife or husband is the one person in the world that God has given us to cherish. Now, in his letter to the Ephesians, um, uh, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, but Paul gives us the ideal pattern for the behavior for husbands. Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless and in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, the idea of uh, husbands sacrificially serving their wives as Christ served the church may be considered as taking the Bible a little bit too literally. But the brilliant reward of actually following that advice is a radiant wife who happily cooperates with the husband's leadership as someone she can totally respect and trust. In fact, putting each other first is the great secret principle of 
marriage success. On a personal note, Ephesians 5.25 dramatically changed my life. When I was 29, I was unmarried, and I had uh, a very jaundiced view of marriage. I didn't like the idea of the primacy of men and of the lack of equal opportunities for wives. Anyway, I had to be in Malta at the time, commissioning a ship with the Navy. And uh, I was asked to lead a Bible study. And uh, when I was uh, on marriage, and when I read this verse, Ephesians 5.25, I discovered a wonderful news that God did not believe in male supremacy either. And that was a wonderful revelation to me. And as a result of that, my view of marriage completely changed. I saw it as something really worthwhile having a go at. <laughs> at that time, Eileen was uh, serving in the Wrens in England, and uh, I had met her uh, through the Naval Christian Fellowship for various things, but there was no nothing special. But uh, somehow or another, uh, Eileen arrived in, Mal in Malta herself only one week after that revelation in my mind. And I decided this was God's plan, that he had changed my mind and he had now provided me with a wife. And in fact, after three weeks, we were engaged. And that was the night before my ship sailed away for an 18-month deployment. <clears throat> However, it worked out well in the end. <clears throat> Next point I'd like to look at is treat your wife with respect as the weaker partner. Um, on the face of it, men should, could use this verse to see women as possibly inferior. But the Greek word used for weaker in this verse literally means not so strong, more delicate. Right? It's not a, a word of, of inferiority. So why is this in this, this weakness, this uh, being more delicate, worthy of respect? Because the cause of it is the, of this relative weakness is woman's amazing, extraordinary potential for bearing children. God-given, And uh, sorry. Oh well, I will get it right. Well, yes, this uh, amazing thing—the biology, the biology of of women necessitates them enduring times of physical and mental vulnerability from an early age. Sadly, men of the world have routinely taken advantage of women's relative weakness. However, I believe that men, especially Christians, should bow down in wonder and respect at the way all women cope courageously with their biology, graciously and, gr and but go courageously and graciously with the demands of your biology. Jesus, for example, was totally in sympathy with the woman who suffered from an issue of blood that made her unclean according to the Mosaic law. But Jesus understood how she was made. The point is that women are generally physically vulnerable and weaker than men. And that's the reason God has created men as being 
more strong, more powerful, more aggressive, because that is their role, is to defend the woman and any family that it may have. Right. The, uh, the problem is that men generally rate physical strength and aggression highly and give it too much respect. But Jesus uh, made it quite clear that this was not his valuation. He said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And then he rammed it home by washing his disciples' feet. There is a verse in the Bible which has caused 2,000 years of painful misunderstanding in marriage. Genesis 3.16. Uh, spoken to, uh, spoken to, uh, God spoke, spoke these words to Eve after they had sinned in the garden. Your husband will rule over you. I wonder how many times Christian husbands have quoted this verse at their wives, believing that they had God's authority to justify their overbearing behavior. But they were tragically mistaken. This was not God's command. God was letting Eve know that because of her sin, she would suffer the curse of male domination. And Adam, in his turn, would have to toil and sweat to produce food to keep alive. These were not God's plan for the consequence and curse of sin. Male domination has been a curse. Oh, goodness me. I'll get the hang of this eventually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Turn around to it. So, uh, male domination has been a curse for men as well because it denied them, denied us, the, trend, the tender companionship of marriage that God intended them to enjoy. But the good news is that God redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Now, God created humans in two sexes, male and female, both made in his image. And his purpose in creating sex was so that they could populate the earth through their sexual union. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. These are the very first words that God ever spoke to human beings, written in the first chapters of Genesis. And this is why God established the lifelong exclusive partnership of marriage between the man and the woman to provide the support and protection uh, and companionship to the woman and, and her family and their family and also to fulfill the man's uh, need for companionship. It's not good for the man to be alone. It is God's will that children should have the benefit of a stable two-parent family during their growing years. The prophet Malachi, has not the Lord made them one in marriage? And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. Godly uh, marriage is God's plan to create godly offspring. In focusing on oneness in marriage, Malachi has pointed to Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. When a couple marry, God releases them 
from the authority of the parents. Many marriages have been, marriages have been harmed by interfering in laws. And it's very important for husbands to understand this and to protect their wives. Of course, help from in-laws is immensely useful and beneficial, but it should come without strings. So we can see that God only intended sexual union for a particular purpose, to produce children within the security of a marriage and to help to bond the couple together as one flesh. Therefore, promiscuous and recreational sex of any sort outside of marriage, outside of the marriage bond, is sin. Why? Well, firstly, even in this contraceptive age, inevitably many children will be born into a single parent, a struggling simple par a single parent family or be simply aborted. A quarter of a million children were aborted last year in this country. Secondly, the psychological and physical damage of multiple abusive relationships has been a contribution to the, the massive growth of mental illness amongst children. I'd like to highlight an old-fashioned word used by Peter to describe godly behavior uh, when referring to wives, and that word was purity, which the dictionary defines as chastity, virginity. Paul advised his young friend Timothy, treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Uh, since the advent of Christianity, uh, sexual purity, both male and female, has been highly esteemed until today. Today, purity, when it is mentioned at all, is sneered at and ridiculed and even described as being unhealthy. But the sexual fee free for all of this broken society has the most tragic consequences. Sexual promiscuity in males and females alike obviously is not good training for faithfulness in marriage. And it also robs couples of the magical experience of the honeymoon as they've already given the unique gift of their purity to others. And this knowledge weakens the bonding power of their sexual love. By the way, how can a wife and her husband remain pure if they have sex? Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. In other words, loving sex within God's marriage, within God's rules, is pure. It's important to say this because historically, the church has been reluctant to release marital sex from the taint of sin. And it has meant that the, uh, the matter has spoiled the joy of millions of marriages over the years because of unnecessary guilt. And married couples should study that neglected book, The Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, which actually celebrates in poetic language, poetic language the honeymoon experience as a gift of God. Jesus made God's boundaries uh, for sex quite clear in his Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman trustfully, lustfully, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Even indulging in sex in the imagination is sin. What does this say about the consumption of pornography? 
No, sexual attraction is not sinful itself. That is because God has given us that. Every human being has that nature. But allowing it to develop into lustful imagining is an offence. We can't avoid the temptation, but we can call on the Holy Spirit to help us to take captive impure thought. Hebrews, Jesus was tempted like us in every way, but was without sin. That tells us that temptation itself is not sin. And then because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help us in our temptation. So we can't say to God, Lord, you have no idea how hard it is for me because he suffered it himself. I have rather focused on sex, but I make no apologies. The misuse of our sexual natures is so hard to resist in our present culture. When I was a teenager, I was kept in line partially by ignorance and by the fear of the uh, disapproval of society. But neither of these restraints exist today. In fact, it's the other way around. So, whether young or old, there is no need to despair if you have lost your purity by, for one reason or another. God offers a new beginning to all who sincerely repent and ask for forgiveness and decide and determine to change direction. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can start again with a clean sheet and a hard earned experience, hard -earned experience of God's wisdom. Eileen and I attended Abigail uh, Lane's marriage last weekend. It was a lovely service and uh, it lasted the usual hour and a half or so. But the essential part of it was over in a few minutes when she and Ollie made their vows to each other in the presence of God and their friends and family. It's those promises those vows which translate friendship into holy matrimony. So I'll end, if you're pleased to hear, with this quote from the author, Thornton Wilder. I didn't marry you because you were perfect. I didn't even marry you because I loved you. I married you, married you because you gave me a promise. That promise made up for your faults and the promise I gave you made up for mine. Two imperfect people got married and it was the promise that made the marriage. And when our children were growing up, it was the house that protected them and it wasn't our love that protected them. It was that promise. Amen. Oh,